welcome to lecture 26 of machine learning from data. I'm going to continue discussing the kernel trick and look at some results on data and discuss a little bit, you know, you know how to pick the kernel and what exactly is the kernel. Okay, but let's have a quick recap of what we did before. So we continued discussing the support vector machine, but we now introduced the nonlinear transform and in particular we introduced the dual version of the problem. Okay, and what was the reason that we did that? The reason we introduced the dual version of the problem is it allowed us to in implement the entire support vector algorithm, the entire optimal hyperplane algorithm, using just inner products. Okay, and what was that? Uh, and, and it turns out that just like the original primal version of the uh, support vector algorithm, the optimal hyperplane algorithm, the dual version is also just a quadratic program. Okay, and I'm showing that quadratic program boxed here on the top right. Okay. And the version here that's being shown is the version that can be used with non-separable data. Okay, so C is this regularization constant that you know trades off the margin violations with the size of the margin. Okay. And you get to pick C. The larger C is, the, 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 the more you're focusing on the in-sample error, the less you're allowing margin violations. The smaller C is, the more regularized uh, the, the classifier will be. Okay. Now, you know, as I mentioned, this dual version of the problem allows us to formulate the entire algorithm, including the final hypothesis as shown on the, on the bottom left, entirely using inner products. Okay. And that allowed us to, to say, well, what if I could com compute the inner product in my feature transform space without actually going there? And the object that does that inner product computation is what we call a kernel. Okay. So let's see what we were able to accomplish okay, with the support vector machine. So first, the optimal hyperplane controls overfitting. Why? Because it's maximally regularized. It's, it, it has the largest possible margin, the largest robustness to input noise. Okay. And this is illustrated, you know, with a feature transform into the third order polynomial feature space where, you know, if you just do regression for classification, you clearly overfit. But if you do the optimal hyperplane in this third order polynomial space, then, you know, things look good. And that's because the complex dimensionality of the space cannot be fully utilized because the algorithm maximally regularizes and what effectively defines the separator is this small number of support vectors. So effectively the number of uh, parameters, the few support vectors that you can, can use to define the, 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 the boundary is small, even though you have many dimensions to play with. Okay. And this suggests we can go to large dimensions. We can go to almost perhaps infinite dimensions while not losing control of E out because we have in some sense optimally, maximally regularized. And it's a very nice algorithm because it's not iterative, it's, it's a quadratic programming algorithm which we know how to solve. And last lecture, we addressed the computation issue. That's what the kernel allows us to do because going to infinite dimensions is not physically possible, it's computationally impossible. Okay. But the kernel allows us to do that by saying, we can, come by, by, by exploiting the fact that this algorithm is an inner product algorithm and saying that, you know, we can compute that inner product using a function in my original space. That's what the kernel is. Okay. And we did a few examples and we'll see a few more examples today. Okay. So we saw the polynomial kernel last time where, you know, if, you, if your feature uh, transform takes you from your original X space, X1 to XD into a polynomial space, okay, and we, we played around with algebraic constants to make things more convenient, okay, then we saw that we can compute the kernel in our original space, okay, by just taking the dot product in our original space and raising it to some power, okay, for the quadratic uh, uh, polynomial kernel, we raise to the power 2, and the general qth order kernel raises to the power q. Okay, now, you know, even though this is not an infinite dimensional transform, it's very efficient to compute the kernel in your X space, but transforming to a high order polynomial space and then computing the dot product in that space is computationally uh, challenging, especially when Q is large. And so immediately we, we get the benefit of the kernel just even in finite dimensional polynomial transforms by virtue of the fact that the, the, the kernel computation in our original space is quick. And also it doesn't entail us having to uh, even construct the nonlinear features. We can we, we only need the inner products. Then we discuss the, the Gaussian kernel, which is also called the radial basis function kernel. And we'll see why in a little while. <clears throat> okay. And and I explicitly derived the one-dimensional RBF kernel, which corresponds in some sense to a transform into an infinite dimensional, sort of almost like a polynomial infinite dimensional transform, except for the fact that you you normalize by e to the minus x squared. And we derive the kernel. It's it's e to the minus you know, the difference between x and x prime squared. So that's that's basically the Gaussian. 
Okay. And there's the d-dimensional version of the Gaussian kernel, which we, we also mentioned last time, e to the minus gamma, x minus x prime, the norm of that squared. Okay. And um, um, I'm showing on the right uh, a, a few examples of you know, fitting the digits data with different choices for gamma and different choices for C. Remember the soft margin. Okay, C large means you're basically the hard margin. C small, basically you're, you're, uh, you're, not, you're focusing on regularization, not so much on, um, not so much on, uh, on fitting the data, okay, allowing lots of margin penetration. Okay. Now, gamma is an interesting guy. We, we previously saw the Gaussian with an R squared in the denominator. So gamma plays the role of the inverse of the scale. So gamma large means that the scale is very small. Gamma small means that the scale is very large. Okay. And so um, what I'm showing here is, you know, on the top right, C is infinity basically means C very, very large means you're, you're doing the hard margin, okay, in this infinite dimensional space. Now you can get away with that because we know the data is separable in this infinite dimensional space. And so you can do, you can run the hard margin classifier and, and look, no surprise, you have fit the data perfectly, okay, and you have really overfit. So choosing, uh, when you have an infinite dimensional kernel, you're doing learning in an infinite dimensional space, you cannot go for the hard margin classifier. So you have to go for the soft margin classifier. And we've picked now for the bottom two pictures, C reasonably small, okay? Which means that you're focusing more on regularization, much less on the sum of the margin violations. Okay, so C is small. Okay? So that means, C small means <clears throat> focus less on the ensemble error. Okay, and now gamma, uh, in this, in the, in the middle picture, the the width is very small, so you you know you get a very wiggly boundary, okay. But you can see some margin violations uh, and and even some misclassification. So you see this red X point here; it's in the blue region, and these blue these blue points are in the red region. So that's coming from the fact that we are allowing margin violations. C is not you know very large, okay. And what happens if you choose gamma small? So you choose a larger radius. Well, then the equivalent in some sense to the kernel, you know. Uh, uh, not not uh, uh, having very very narrow bumps, but much wider bumps. Okay? And now you see you get a beautiful separator, okay? something like close to the best we've seen so far. Okay? So awesome power that has come now with the, the ability to use a kernel to do learning in infinite dimensions. You have to regularize, so you have to pick C small, okay? and you have to choose your kernel width carefully. So let's see what happens with different uh, kernel widths gamma. Okay? Um, so as you can see here, you know, when, when gamma is small, that means that the uh, scale parameter is, parameter is large. Think of this as, you know, Gaussian bumps that are large, similar to an RBF kernel. And we'll see why we should think of it that way. And you get a nice smooth classifier. And if we would identify the support vector, vectors, there would be these few red and blue data points that are close to the curve. So a nice smooth classifier that seems to do a good job. If you choose the, if you choose the medium gamma, so small width kernels, okay, it, you're, you're, you're starting to get you know, more contorted regions that are placing small bumps at the data point. And if you choose gamma very, very large, so tiny uh, scale parameter, it's basically starting to look very close to the nearest neighbor. So this, and you'll always uh, fit the data. Okay. So the RBF kernel is very powerful. It's a transform into an infinite dimensional space. And you basically have two parameters to play with. You've got the amount of regularization, which is, you, you, sh you should pick that to be reasonably small so that because you're in infinite dimensions, you need to really focus on regularizing, not so much on margin violations, and the width of the kernel. The width of the kernel, we because we don't know, we don't, we're not ever physically going to transform into this space, we don't know what the right scale parameter there is. So the gamma and the C often have to be chosen using some technique like cross-validation. Okay. Um, so now, you know, let's dig a little bit deeper and see a few more kernels. I'll show you the, we'll look a little bit more closely at this RBF Gaussian kernel, and I'll show you a, a kernel for neural networks. And then we'll sort of try to understand what exactly is the kernel measuring. This is what it's gonna turn out, is gonna bring us all the way back to similarity-based methods. And then we'll talk a little bit about how do you pick your kernel, and I'll show you some results, and that'll end today's lecture. Okay, so let's go to the board, and then we'll come back to see some pictures, nice pictures. Okay, so let's drill a little bit deeper into this infinite dimensional RBF kernel, the Gaussian kernel, and I'll set the scale parameter gamma to be one. So my kernel of x and x prime is equal to uh, e to the minus x minus x prime, no. Okay, just for simplicity. Now, 
Remember, when you solve the dual version of the problem that uses only this kernel, which represents inner products, you get the alpha n, alpha n star. So this is a quick review of even last lecture. And the final hypothesis, uh, g of x, so for a test input x, is equal to uh, the sign of um, the sum from, and now I will explicitly say that, you know, we only need to consider the sum over the, the support vectors, the data points for which the Lagrange multiplier alpha n star is uh, positive. So alpha n star, some of them are zero. So we can throw these data points away. They have no role to play in the final classification. So, you know, in some sense, useless data for the classification, for the final classifier. And then you've got alpha n star that are positive. Okay. And um, you, you also have some alpha n stars that are that are C, okay, but the alpha n stars that are positive and strictly um, uh, less than C are the support vectors. When the alpha n stars are, uh, are, are, are C, those are the data points that penetrate the margin, okay, and the alpha n stars that are in between zero and C are the ones that are that are on the margin, that are on the cushion. Okay, so these are your support vectors. Um, so the final classifier g of x is the sign over your support vectors. So alpha n star uh, greater than zero, okay, of alpha n star uh, y n. Okay. Now we have the kernel, okay, the kernel of uh, x n and x your input. Okay, so this is the this is w transpose x. Okay, plus b star. And we already saw last time that we can compute this B star uh, using only the kernel. It's, 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 it depends only on, the, on, on what are the support vectors and, and the inner products. Okay, so let's assume that we've computed B star. Okay. And in the case of the Gaussian kernel, this is equal to the sign of the sum of alpha n star greater than zero, alpha n star y n uh, e to the minus, oh sorry, this, there's a squared here, e to the minus norm of x n minus x squared. Okay. And then you have a plus b. Okay. Now, I want to compare this. I want to show you a comparison between what the support vector machine produces and what we saw earlier, which we called the RBF network. So the RBF network. Okay. The final hypothesis g of x was equal to okay, the sign of w0 plus uh, w, the sum from, uh, you know, j equals 1 to k of wj uh, e to the minus mm, x minus mu j squared, where there would have been a scale parameter r squared, but I've just set that to 1 just so that we can compare apples to apples. Okay, so this is the RBF network. Let's compare. Wow, they look very similar. Okay, well, we have our B star here, which corresponds to W0, okay? And then we have a sum, okay, with certain weights, okay? And the Gaussian similarity measure, okay? We have a sum, the, we have a bias, and then a sum with weights of, of the similarity, similarities between um, X and centers of my, my Gaussian bumps, okay? And weighted by WJ. Similarities between x and data points, okay, weighted by my Lagrange multipliers. So this plays the role of the wj, okay, and this here plays the role of my mu j, okay. And now, you know, when we when we talked about the RBF network, we said, oh, okay, so you know, you have to you have to figure out k, for, for example, with cross validation. So figure out k, okay. and then the mu j are, you know constructed using unsupervised learning as centers of, you know, clusters. So mu j via unsupervised learning as cluster centers. Okay, and then the wj, w0 and wj come from, you know, treating this as a linear model and then running on whatever linear model algorithm you want, uh, you know, um, fit as linear model. Okay, so that was the RBF. But look at what goes on here. Well, okay. it's exactly the same functional form. 
Okay. What is K? What is the number of centers? K. K is equal to the number of support vectors. Vectors. Automatically determined. When we solve the optimal hyperplane algorithm, it automatically tells us what are the support vectors that will play a role here. So the non-zero, the number of non-zero uh, Lagrange multipliers is exactly the number of terms in this sum. What are the centers? We don't have to learn with unsupervised learning. The centers are the support vectors. There, yeah, xn. The centers are the support vectors. The important data points. It makes a lot of sense. Okay, and so you can view this optimal, okay, margin, maximum margin kernel machine as essentially an RBF network where the number of centers has been defined, has been determined for you, and the positions of those centers have also been determined for you. There's nothing for you to determine. It just spits out an RBF network. And we know that it is the maximum margin RBF network in some infinite dimensional space. So it's optimally regularized. Wow! Automatically determines the number of centers and automatically determines the centers, the, the position of those centers as data points, as in specifically support vectors. Bam! Okay. Just plug and play once you give me that kernel. Okay. Let me show you another uh, learning model that we saw before, the neural network. The neural network, and let's look at the two-layer neural network in order to compare. Now the deep network, we, we can't really make this comparison, but for the two-layer neural network. Okay, so if you remember, there was the initial input layer, so you have X, then you have number of hidden units, M hidden units, so you have one set of weights, W1, and we, we call these weights, these perceptrons, uh, V1, V2, and so on, and then we collected those into one final perceptron, which we call W, okay, and that was the output. And inside here were tanage. Okay, so the last, the last guy is sine, okay? So inside here, in this activation is tanage. Okay, so what's the final hypothesis? So H of X, okay, equals, you know, the sine of something. So let's figure that out. So this is a bit of a review. So H of X is equal to um, the sine of, okay, so now we have a perceptron, W0 plus the sum, okay, from I equals 1 to M, or let's say I equals 1 to M, the number of hidden units in this node, the tan H, so what's coming out of this node is the tan H of what? Of a perceptron evaluated on the, the, the input X of uh, VI transpose X. Okay. So this is the two-layer neural network. Okay. Turns out we can simulate the two-layer neural network by choosing an appropriate kernel. Okay. So what's the kernel? Let me change the kernel. That's all I'm going to do. Change the kernel. The kernel is going to be 10H of uh, some constant C X transpose X prime. So X dot X prime plus let's say some other constant nu. Okay. Now, it turns out that this is not a valid kernel for all choices of nu and c, but you know, for there, there are specific conditions on c and nu that we can pick in order to make this a valid kernel. And I leave you to, to look around in the literature for what are the valid choices of c and nu. But this is a, you know, you can give me x and x prime and I can define a kernel. Okay, it's a function of, you know, the dot product between x and x prime, okay, modulo some constants. And then I take the tan each. Okay, so now with the RBF, I took the distance between x and x prime, and I and I and I rate and I did e to the minus of the distance squared. In the polynomial kernel, this is similar to the polynomial kernel. The polynomial kernel was k of x and x prime is equal to some constant plus x transpose x prime to power q. Okay, so that's the polynomial kernel. Okay, so this is the neural network kernel. Kernel. Okay. So let's see what that final hypothesis looks like. So in general, it's the same. It's the expansion over the support vectors. When you solve the uh, dual uh, quadratic program, you get the alpha n star. It's the expansion, the sign of the expansion over 
the support vectors of the similarity between your support vector and your test point plus the optimal B star, okay, the bias. Okay, and we can see explicitly what that would be in this case. Okay, so this would be the sign of um, the sum over your support vectors alpha n star, yn, okay, the kernel, which is tan h of, you know, uh, some constant c, uh, x n transpose x plus some constant nu, okay, and then plus b star. Okay. Sign of that. Let's compare. Well, I still have my constant w0, I have my optimal bias b star. But now let's look at the sum. So here we have a sum over hidden nodes of the tan h of, you know, the dot product between x and the vector v for corresponding to the perceptron into node i. And this vector v is highly tuned to the data. Okay. In fact, it, this is an augmented, has an augmented term. So this is actually uh, vi transpose the unaugmented x plus vi, vi zero. And here, oh, sorry, um, well, I left out the wi here. And here, we have exactly the same term. We have a weight for that corresponding non-zero alpha. Okay, so we have a weight times the tan h of, you know, some vector times x, some vector times x, okay, plus a constant. And you can choose these constants. So this is playing the same role as VI transpose, and this is playing the role of WI, and this is playing the role of W0. Exactly the same functional form. Now let's see how this worked for the neural network. For the neural network, unlike the radial basis function, where we pick centers in an unsupervised way, for the neural network, we finely tune these VI, tuned. And you can view these VIs as finely tuned feature transform. So you take your X and you feature transform it into an M-dimensional space, okay? And M has to be fixed, has to be given in the two-layer neural network. And in the support vector machine with the neural network kernel, this simulates the two-layer neural network. Look at what has happened, okay? Um, we have exactly the same functional form, but you don't get to tune the features. The features are support vectors. Okay, so the features are support vectors. The features in the first layer. So these weights in the first layer are support vectors. Mm, very interesting. Okay, so in some sense, you're computing uh, the similarity between your x and a support vector, but that turns out to be just the dot product, and then you take the tan h because that's the kernel, and that's what simulates the neural network. And then, okay, how many hidden nodes are in this neural network? The number of hidden nodes, number of hidden nodes, nodes is equal to the number of support vectors. You don't get to choose it. You don't even need to use, so all this gets automatically set in the optimal hyperplane algorithm with this kernel. So the number of hidden nodes in your, in your first hidden layer is the number of support vectors. That's automatically determined. And then also these weights, the feature transform is automatically determined. The feature transform that is being implemented by the first hidden layer is automatically determined. And it's very simple. It's related to the support vectors. So everything is automatically determined and we're simulating of a neural network. Wow, look at this power. Now it turns out that the two hidden layer neural network is all you need to be able to implement anything. Okay. We use more depth in practice, but you don't need it in theory. Okay. And so what this means is that the support vector machine with the right choice of kernel can basically simulate the neural network. And so if you can see the amount of power that I've given you, you can, so if with the, you can pick whatever kernel you want, as long as it's positive, definite, and symmetric. You can pick whatever kernel you want, and, and then you can, you can run this optimal hyperplane algorithm in that space, usually infinite dimensional, without any worries. You just have to pick you know, your regularization parameter if you're doing the soft margin, okay? and you have to pick your kernel parameters, in this case, C and U. But with this power of this kernel, we can basically do anything, and we can do it efficiently. And we can do it optimally, optimally robust.
optimally robust because it's, it has maximum regularization, maximum margin. So this is, a, you can think of this as not only have we de automatically determined the number of hidden units it, and the, the transform weights, the perceptrons in the hidden layer are determined by support vectors. Not only have we determined those, but we have the optimal fit in the sense that it is the maximum margin. So you cannot get more robustness. Okay. So support vector machines or kernel machines, support vector machines with the kernel trick, which we call kernel machines, can do radial basis function networks. They can do neural networks. They are maximally regularized. And it's a quadratic programming algorithm, which is not iterative. It always, it's, con it's a convex optimization problem. It's an example of a convex optimization problem, which we know how to solve essentially exactly. So what could be better? It's a real power tool. Okay. And so therefore it's worth you know, taking a little bit of a closer look at what exactly is the kernel. So what exactly is the kernel? So what is the kernel? A closer look, a deeper look. Look at the kernel. Ah, I erased the main function that I wanted to keep. So let me rewrite it. So the final hypothesis g of x is essentially okay, an expansion okay, over your support vectors alpha n star greater than zero, alpha n star y n kernel of x n and x. So x n is the data point, the support vector, and x is the input okay, plus v star. Okay. And now Let's re let me remind you what the kernel is. So, you know, you have, you have x and x prime. Okay, the kernel is surreptitiously performing the following task, but without explicitly performing the following task. Okay. You've transformed these, so you go to phi of x, and now we can allow this to be infinite dimensional because we don't actually have to do it. And you transform this to phi of x prime. This is what we call z, the, the feature, and this is what we call z prime. Okay. And then take the dot product, z dot z prime, okay? And that is what the kernel of x, oh, this is x prime, sorry, x and x prime computes. Okay, so you can think of this as a black box, okay? Which sort of represents what the kernel is effectively doing, but it doesn't actually do that. It bypasses the, the transform and directly gives us that number, okay? But at the end of the day, it's giving us the dot product in some space. So in this space, okay, it can be infinite dimensional, but for visualization, let me just draw it as if it's finite dimensional. So in that space, you have z, okay, and you have z prime. And the dot product, z dot z prime, is just equal to the norm of z, the norm of z prime. And the cosine, let's call this angle theta z z prime, the, the cosine of theta z z prime. Okay, so up to norms. So if we were to normalize a z and z prime, so if we did uh, z over norm of z dotted into z prime over norm of z prime, then this is the cosine of theta z z prime. And let's look at what this cosine does. So when z and z prime are on top of each other, z and z prime are on top of each other. When you normalize them, they're the same unit vector. This is one. Okay, so this is one. So cosine of theta z z prime is equal to one when z and z z and z prime are basically identical. Okay, up to the normalizing. Okay, and when z and z prime are in the opposite direction, okay, maximally dissimilar, then the cosine is minus one. Z is not equal, approximately equal to z prime. Okay, modulo the norms. Of course, there's a norm here, but basically, you can think of the cosine of this angle as a measure of similarity. It's, it's sometimes called the cosine similarity. So this is up to the norms, z, z prime, you know, a similarity, what's called the cosine similarity between z and z prime. Okay. So the kernel, which is computing this, Providing that you can compute a size of z and z prime as well, which is what is the size of z and z prime? It's just the kernel of zz square root and the kernel of zz prime square root. So this is you know the square root of the kernel of zz, and this is the square root of the kernel of you know 
oh, sorry, x x and x prime x prime. Okay. So modulo the norms of z. Okay. Well, the kernel is essentially computing a measure of similarity. The kernel, the kernel is essentially computing a measure of similarity. The kernel is computing a measure of similarity. We'll let that sink in a little. The kernel is computing a measure of similarity. And so then what is the final hypothesis? The final hypothesis, okay, you can think of as it identifies a set of important data, the support vectors. So the final hypothesis finds important data, i.e. the support vectors. Now, when you give me an input, I compute the similarity to that data point, that important data point. Okay. I weighed it, okay, and then I have my you know, bias, but I'm basically computing a weighted similarity to a bunch of data points. So, finds the important data points, okay, the support vectors, and then computes a weighted similarity to those data points. Okay. And so any inner product algorithm, and the linear model is very similar, okay, so any inner product algorithm can be converted, can be kernelized into this form, and is essentially a similarity-based method. Okay. So in order to design a good kernel, okay, all you have to do is design a good measure of similarity, and, and, and ensure that the properties of symmetry and positive definiteness hold, in which case that measure of similarity corresponds to some inner product in some space, usually infinite dimensional. And then you can roll out all the power of the optimal hyperplane. And it, at the end of the day, is just a, an optimal version of a similarity-based method. Okay. That finds the hyperplane in that weird space for which this similarity kernel corresponds. Okay to which this similarity kernel, if you were to transform, would compute uh, the dot product. Okay, So we roll out the support vector machine, the kernel machinery, and we're essentially running a similarity-based method where we identify the important data points, you know, similarity to those data points, weighted similarity, boom, that gives you your classification. So we've, we started with similarity-based methods and said, oh, that's the simplest thing you can do. And we've gone full circle because RBF network we did, neural network we did, and then now the support vector machine can simulate both of those and you can put any kernel you want, which is a similarity. Okay? And so everything can be done with this similarity-based approach, okay? optimally. And at the end of the day, we have a similarity-based method. We've gone around full circle. We started with similarity, did complex things, and we're back at similarity. And we might think to ourselves, well, we shouldn't be surprised because what else is there? I give you data and I ask you to predict on a test point. Okay. Essentially, the only thing you can do is, which leverages the data is to say, well, you know, my test point is similar to what data points and then I'm going to use those to classify. What else can you do? And if there's no such similarity measure that you can uh, sort of implement, that says that you know if you your test point is is similar to your data points, then the test classification should somehow be related. If there's no such relationship, then there's there's essentially in some sense no target function. There's the problem is unlearnable. Okay. So for learnable problems, essentially everything is a similarity based method. It's just that we now have a machinery that makes it all clean, optimal, algorithmically uh, efficient, okay. and in order to now, run this machinery in any application. All you have to do is define the kernel, i.e., figure out what's a good measure of similarity for your problem. So, you know, using kernel machines. Using kernel machines. One. 
for your problem. What is a good measure of similarity? Okay, so figure that out. And two, for that measure of similarity, okay, is it plausible that a linear model will work in the corresponding feature transformed space? Will a linear model work in the feature transformed space? You almost don't have much control over this. There's almost nothing to do here. You just have your measure of similarity and you, and if it's going into an infinite dimensional space, then you can certainly always separate. But if you use the soft margin, then you know, you run it and does it give you good results? Okay, will it fit well? Okay. And so the real challenge or the real task that you face if you want to run the whole support vector machinery, the whole kernel machinery, okay, is to come up with the right measure of similarity, i.e. the right kernel. And so, so now let's see a few examples of this and then that'll end today's lecture. Okay, so, um, you know, the inner product measures similarity, so the kernel measures similarity, coming up with good kernels, is, it, is equivalent to coming up with the right measure of similarity for your problem, for your application. Okay. So construct the right measure of similarity. Uh, if it's an infinite dimensional space, you have no problem. But otherwise, you know, you need a linear model to be pl plausible in that transformed space. Otherwise, you won't be able to separate the data. So it's the wrong measure of similarity. Okay. And let's have a look at some examples. So string kernels. So if your if your domain of interest is string, so now we're going to just look at you know kernels in all these various domains just to show you that with very little difficulty, with almost effortlessly, we can apply the support vector machine technology to any domain: strings, graphs, images, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, okay, so let's say your your application domain is string, and let me give you some examples. So DNA sequences, text. So here, you know, I have you know, a sequence and another sequence, and maybe we're trying to classify, do these sequences represent proteins that do the same thing, okay? And so you come up with a measure of similarity between sequences, and you know that, so the se sequence is an input X, and another sequence is an input X prime, and you know, the, the, the measure of similarity need not be, you know, a function, it can be an algorithm. So you could compute, for example, the longest common subsequence, okay, and normalize that by the product of the length of the sequences, because remember the kernel, you know, should measure similar similarity up to the norm. So you might multiply by the two norms, the two lengths, and then compute the, the um, you know, the, the percentage similarity as um, the longest common subsequence divided by the maximum length of a sequence. So that's a measure of similarity. Now I have a measure of similarity, okay, four strings relevant to DNA sequences, and I can go and do my classification task using the support vector machinery, the kernel machinery. Okay. Let's take an example of text. Now, in text, there are, you know, feature vectors, features that are typically constructed involve things that are, that are called bags of words, where, you know, you count the number of occurrences of specific words, that can be a feature vector, or co-occurrences of, of sub, substrings or subsequences, those can be feature vectors. Okay. So, you know, uh, what I want to show you here is that, you know, sometimes you have to be relatively careful in, in constructing your similarity measure. So I'm showing you two pieces of text here. Dear sir, with reference to your letter dated, you know, blah, 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 I want to confirm that the order number placed, blah, 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 you know, we would appreciate if you can send me the account details to which I must pay, and, you know, we are expecting a 2% discount, and so on and so forth. So this is clearly a business email. Okay. And then, dear Jane, I'm terribly sorry to hear the news of your hip fracture. I can only imagine what a terrible time you must be going through, blah, blah, blah. Well, this is an example of an email that, you know, is, is clearly a personal email of Jane's, and some friend is consoling her on, you know, some hip fracture. Okay, so now, are these texts similar or not? Okay, because this is the question you need to answer in order to derive a, a kernel, in order to define a measure of similarity, in order to define your kernel. Now, your kernel can be based on the input, which is bags of words, okay? But the first thing you have to ask yourself is, for my application, are these two pieces of text similar? Okay, and if you are classifying spam versus non-spam, they are similar, okay? Because neither of these are spam. One is business and one is about personal, but neither of them are spam. On the other hand, if you're classifying business versus personal, I'm trying to build a classifier for my own mailbox, which is business versus personal, then these are not similar. And so whatever your kernel is, so for example, if you're using bag of words features, then you might identify certain kinds of 
features as you know, business features, certain kinds of features as spam features, certain kinds of features as personal features, and whatever your me measure of similarity should take into account the nature of the problem. Okay? Because you know these two these two inputs are similar or not depending on the specific task. Okay? And so this just shows you that you know when you define a, a kernel, you must look at exactly what is the task you're solving, and the task you're solving can be different. Okay, even if the input space and the inputs are the same. Okay. Let's look at you know, classification problems on graphs. Just to show you that it's effortless now to, to work in any domains you want, as long as you can get me a measure of similarity for your classification problem. Okay. Um, here are examples of classification problems involving graphs. So protein networks. And I give you protein networks, and I ask you, do they perform the same function? Or nodes within a network. So you have this huge Facebook, and here's a node. And I can represent a node by, let's say, its neighborhood, or its two neighborhood, where, we, where, where by neighborhood we mean friends. Okay. And then you might ask, you know, it was successful uh, when I marketed the iPhone to this node. Which other nodes should I market to? Okay, so we're looking for a measure of similarity between nodes in a, in a network, and a node is defined as a graph. Okay, so we can try to come up with similarity measures between graphs. So the kernel takes as input a graph G1 and a graph G2, okay, and outputs a measure of similarity. Once you have that kernel, boom, you can run the kernel machinery and do classification. Okay, and there are many ways of constructing similarity metrics between, between graphs, based, based on sort of random walks, degree sequences, connectivity properties, mixing properties, and so on and so forth. Okay. Sometimes, you know, you can just look at the, so I'm a node and, you know, I have a set of nodes who are in my neighborhood and you're a node and you have a set of nodes. We can just take those two sets of nodes and ask what's the set similarity. And there are, you know, a, a variety of kernels that, you know, take as input sets and the, the sort of Jacquard coefficient is one of the most popular. You look at the intersection of the two sets, divide by the size of the union. Okay, so that's a measure of similarity. In fact, we can prove that this is, is related to a metric. Okay, so that's, in fact, a very well-behaved measure of similarity. Okay. Let's talk about images. And wow, look, we've effortlessly been able to address problems in text, problems in graphs, and now images. And I'm showing a young picture of me. Look at how handsome I used to be. And, uh, you know, a, a picture of a, a co-author of mine some time ago. And look at how handsome he is. Okay. And then the question is, okay, so we're doing image. So the kernel, for whatever the classification problem is, or the application that I'm trying to solve, Okay, for build a predictive form, you know, it's going to take as input image one and image two. Okay, and now you take these two images, and the kernel is supposed to say, are the two images similar? So you build a kernel that's based on you know whatever features you can extract. Let's say convolutional free features, and then you build a kernel that outputs similarity. Okay, now the question you have to answer is, are these? So when building this kernel, this measure of similarity, you'd have to ask yourself the question: Are these two images similar? And it depends on the task. Okay, so these two images are similar if you're trying to recognize pictures with faces. And so whatever kernel you produce must extract the relevant features and output the right measure of similarity that would say that these are, have a high level of similarity because there are, two, there are faces in each of these pictures. Okay? And once you have that kernel, boom, you can run the support vector machinery, the kernel machinery, get the optimal classifier, get the support vectors, the important data points, and ready to classify. Okay? Okay. On the other hand, these two images are not similar if the task is, let's say, access control. And you are trying to distinguish Malik from Christos. Then these two are not similar. So you need much more detailed measure of similarity. The kernel would have to get more intricate. Okay. And um, you know, you could imagine even using a deep network to build image features. Okay. And then Euclidean similarity between image features built from some, let's say, image net uh, pre-trained deep network would be the measure of similarity. And now you can, on top of that, run the kernel machinery. Bam. Okay. So many things you can do with the power of the kernel machinery. Okay. And what is that? It's just a linear model. Wow, the power of the linear model. Together with the inner product algorithm, together with the kernel, together with the notion of the optimal hypothesis. Okay. And it's no surprise that at some, at some point, this support vector machinery just completely wiped neural networks from the face of research and application. But now neural networks in the form of deep networks are back with lots of data. You can pre-train and get nice image features okay, or nice you know, text features, nice language models, and so on. Okay. And then we can apply those feature transforms to real data. Okay. So, you know, one other thing that I'll mention in conclusion is that at the end of the day, this fancy machinery is a similarity-based method. And there's nothing else that there is in machine learning. Okay. You have data, you have a test point, you know, if you cannot identify the data that should contribute to the classification of this test point, if you cannot identify a similarity, okay, 
uh, that would identify those data points, then what, what can you do? There's nothing you can do. The, the premise of learning is that you can conclude something about a test point because all we care about is the test point by looking at the data and, and how the classes, how, how the data has been classified. Okay. And by looking at the data, you can infer something about the test point. We don't care about the data, we care about the test point. And, you know, but that method of identifying which data points are going to play a, a big role by definition could be uh, uh, looked at as a similarity. Okay, and so that concludes our discussion of support vector machines ending on this very powerful kernel machine. Okay, so use it, it's very powerful, just like a deep network, and this is much easier to handle because all you have to do is choose your regularization parameter C and your kernel. The kernel is where all the magic occurs. Okay. Um, and so now we've covered similarity based methods, RBF networks, neural networks, the linear model, and the robust linear model. So neural networks are cascaded linear models. Uh, uh, support vector machine is the robust linear model, and then it can be used with any measure of similarity, any kernel, okay, to do very powerful learning even in infinite dimensional spaces. So that more or less covers, you know, uh, what we will do with respect to techniques, advanced techniques. Okay. And so what we will move on to now are sort of methods. Uh, now the next lecture will be methods that are useful for all techniques, and in particular, we're going to talk about pre-processing or learning aids, things that can help in almost any uh, application and no matter what technique you decide to use. Okay. We will mostly focus on putting the data into a nice default form, you know, because most algorithms that we build, whatever the technique is, expect the data in some default form. Okay, but for now, checking out.